My name is Sandra Martin, and we are coming from College Station, Texas. We're with Texas A&M University, the College of Veterinary Medicine, through the PEER program. So we are here to give a presentation about cell theory and taxonomy. My name is Sandra Martin. I just finished my first year of veterinary school at Texas A&M, so I have three more years to go. And I am interested in food animal medicine. So I'm thinking about going and working with dairy cows and making sure that all of the products they produce are safe for y'all and that they have good, happy lives. So look forward to talking to y'all for the next bit. So we're gonna start with talking about the cell theory. There are six general principles or keys to the cell theory. They were started by Schlieden and Schwann, who were two German scientists. And they started this theory in 1838. So it's been around a long time, just about as long as we could see cells under a microscope. And these theories have been updated sort of as we learned more things about cells, but they definitely hold true now for all living things. So the first principle of the cell theory is that all living things are made of cells. So here we have a picture of a plant called Anacharis. It's a water plant. So if we were to zoom in on that part of the plant, we just have bigger leaves. But if we were to take a really thin piece of that plant and look at it under a microscope, we could actually see the cells. So every one of those cubes is a cell, and you can see it has a cell membrane. And then if we look very close, we can see an organelle. So this is an electron microscope image, and it comes out in black and white, so somebody has colored it, but it is a real thing. So all of the things that your science teachers are tell telling you about, they are real things, and you can see most of them if you have a good enough microscope. The second part of the cell theory is that the cell is the structural and functional unit of all living things. So I've got pictures of cells, and they're all from a human. So think of what this picture looks like. It's a blood clot. So those red circles that sort of look like donuts are red blood cells, and the yellow strings coming through are called fibrin, and that's a protein that keeps those red blood cells stuck together so that if you get a scratch or some sort of wound, you stop bleeding and don't bleed forever. This next picture is also from a human, so can anyone think of what kind of picture of a cell that is? So that is a neuron. So the sort of gold circle near the middle of the cell is the cell body of the neuron, and then the wider track coming from the cell is called the axon, and then all the little spider webs are called dendrites, and that's where that cell is a motor neuron. So all of those little dendrites are going to muscle tissue, and that's gonna make your muscle contract. And at the top of the picture, you can see the dendrites coming from the other neurons to communicate with that motor neuron and tell it when to tell the muscle to contract. This last picture is a group of cells, also from a human, so think of what group of cells you think this is. This is actually a human embryo. So every one of those little bumps, sort of oval shapes, are cells. The ones around the edge are the cells that will make the placenta that attaches to the uterus. And the clump of cells on the bottom of the screen, that is the part that will eventually become the baby. But you can see that every one of those bumps is a cell. So all humans, and actually all living things, are made up of cells, both when they start out and then when they're fully grown, all of the pieces are cells. The third part of the cell theory is that all cells come from pre-existing cells by division. So here I have a picture of pollen. That's what gives some of y'all allergies, especially as summer is coming. Pollen is sort of the male part of a plant, and so when it comes in contact with the female part of the plant, which is under the flower, so this is a lily flower. If you cut a really thin slice of a lily, stained it and put it on a microscope that looks like this. You can see the ovules, which are sort of the egg of the plant, and then the embryo sacs, where when the pollen and the ovule meet, they go and make an embryo sac, and that's two cells coming together to make a whole plant. Once you have the whole plant, the cells will divide by mitosis, which hopefully is a word some of y'all have heard before, depending on which level of science you're in. But that's when one cell splits to become two exactly identical daughter cells. And you can see the different stages that this process has. And you can actually see those stages. This is a tip of a root that they've taken a very thin slice of and put on a microscope. And you can see the stages. 
you can see where all of the tissues or the DNA is lined up in a line. And you can see on that picture cells where all the DNA is lined up in a line. And then you can see the stage called the anaphase where the DNA splits in half. And you can see just above that cell is a cell in anaphase. So the, the DNA is splitting in half to make two cells. So again, these things that you learn in science are real things. You can see them on microscopes. The fourth part of the cell theory is that cells contain hereditary information passed from cell to cell. And does anyone know what cell, what the information is passed through? So it's passed in DNA. And here I have a picture of a human eye cell. And this cell is undergoing mitosis. It's splitting into two cells. And so the blue stuff in this picture is the DNA. And if this was a cell from a male eye, then part of that blue clump would be an X chromosome and a Y chromosome. And if you took that X chromosome and you unraveled it, and you unraveled it a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, those are very clumped up, then you would eventually have that orange part of the picture, which is a protein wrapped in DNA. And the DNA is how that hereditary information goes from cell to cell. The fifth part of the cell theory is that all cells are basically the same in chemical composition. So here I have two pictures of cells. Rickettsia felis is a bacteria. So it's a unicellular organism. The whole organism is one cell and it is alive. Then we have a white blood cell. White blood cells are in all people, they're in all animals, and so it's a part of a living thing, but the cell itself is not alive. So even though these cells are very different, you can see that they each have a membrane around them, they each have different organelles, those are the darker spots inside the cells, they each have a nucleus, which is for Rickettsia felis, the little circle inside the big circle, and for the white, cer white blood cell, the nucleus is the sort of heart-shaped dark spot in the cell, and they both have a dark spot inside those nuclei. So even though cells can be very different depending on what they do and what they're made of, they are the same in chemical composition. The last part of the cell theory is that all energy flow of life, which is chemical energy, occurs in cells. So here we have a drawing of a cell, and that is a mitochondrion in there. And then we have an actual plant cell, and that little cigar-shaped thing at the top of the picture, labeled with an M, is a mitochondrion. So it does actually look like the picture. Then these are two pictures that are really complicated. Those are pictures that you would learn about when you take biochemistry or organic chemistry in college. But that's how the chemicals move inside the cell. They move in and out of the mitochondria. And that's how the cell makes energy. This is a diagram of how a cell takes sugar and breaks it down. Chemical energy is made when bonds break and reform. And all of the lines in this picture are representative of bonds. And you can see that those bonds are changing as the sugar goes through the cell. So every cell that's alive does some form of this process. Some of them use different kinds of sugars. Some of them have slightly different chemicals in their cells or different processes. But they all have mitochondria and they all break down sugar to make energy. So all chemical energy of life is in cells. So you might think that cells aren't that important and you don't really need to learn about them, but cells are actually very important, especially in medicine. This is a slide from a pancreas. So do you know where your pancreas is? It's sort of to the back of your stomach, right under your ribs, and it's a lobular organ. So if you took a slide of a pancreas, you took a really thin slice of a pancreas, put some stain on it, looked at it under a microscope, it would look like this. And it has these areas called the islets of Langerhans, which are those light pink colored cells that you can see. And if you do a different kind of staining on them, they look like this. Those green cells are called beta cells. And beta cells make insulin. So does anyone know what happens if your insulin gets messed up? You get diabetes. Diabetes is a disease where either your body doesn't make enough insulin or the insulin that your body makes is not able to react to. And people who have diabetes, they have problems in their feet, they have problems in their eyes, they have problems in their whole body. And it's all because this one little kind of cell in the pancreas, which is in your stomach area, has messed up. So as a veterinarian, we spend a lot of time learning about cells. And they're not my favorite thing to learn about. I like learning about bigger things. But you have to know them, especially in any kind of medical field. The 
things that your teachers are telling you about are important and you have to know how cells work. So now we're going to switch a little bit and we're going to talk about taxonomy. So hopefully you know what taxonomy is and I had lots of guesses when I was giving this presentation earlier. Taxonomy doesn't have to do with taxes and it's not taxidermy, but taxonomy is how scientists organize all living things. So we organize them into domains and then domains are split into different kingdoms. Kingdoms are split into different phylum. Phylum are split into classes. Classes are split into orders. Orders are split into families. Families are split into genus. And genus are split into species. So every a group of species that are similar make a genus. A group of genera that are similar make a family. And so on and so forth. And we have a way of memorizing these. And that is do keep precious creatures organized for grumpy scientists. So you see how this works where the D in do stands for domains, the P in keep stands for kingdom, the P in precious stands for phylum, C in creatures for class, O in organized order, four family, grumpy genus, scientist species. So do keep precious creatures organized for grumpy scientists is domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. And so we're going to go through these one by one. And all of the species that are similar are clumped into genera and so on and so forth. So there are three domains of all living things in the world. There's domain archaea, and those are things that are found in very, very extreme environments. This is a picture of Old Faithful, a geyser from Yellowstone National Park. So maybe some of y'all have been to Yellowstone or know what a geyser is. That's an area where there's really hot water under the earth and every once in a while it gets so hot that it boils up and it shoots up through the air from this opening in the earth's surface. If you are able to get a sample of that without getting burned and look at it under a microscope, there are these kind of organisms. And these are two organisms from the domain archaea and they're unicellular and they're prokaryotic and scientists use them to run tests and all kinds of things. Then there's the category domain bacteria. And these are three examples of domain bacteria. Veterinarians need to know about bacteria quite a lot. The B. bifida is a bacteria that is normal inside the human body. So you think of bacteria making you sick, and they do, some of them do. But B. bifidum is one that is normal inside your large intestine. And it's important that you have that in there. It helps you make some vitamins from your food. It helps break your food down. It does all kinds of good things for you. E. coli is a bacteria that is normal inside cows. Cows have it, doesn't make them sick, no problem. But if humans get infected with E. coli through contamination from the cows, it can kill a human. So veterinarians work very hard to make sure that E. coli doesn't contaminate any meat and doesn't contaminate spinach is one that's fairly commonly contaminated. So veterinarians work very hard to make sure that that doesn't happen and that if it does, you know what to do. And that's why you have to cook your hamburgers. And then Bergdorferi is the last picture I had up there. And that is a bacteria that's carried in ticks. So you may put a medicine on the back of your dog's neck or give your dog a medicine once a month to make sure they don't have fleas and ticks and heartworms. Part of the reason you do that is because ticks can carry bacteria like Bergdorferi, which causes Lyme disease. So if a tick jumps on your dog and your dog walks in your house, and the tick jumps off and then bites you, and that tick carried Bergdorf fry, now you have Bergdorf fry. And Lyme disease is a really bad disease, so it's very important that you give your dogs those medicine, and then vets work very hard to make sure those medicines are safe and do really prevent the disease. The last domain is domain eukarya, and these are the things we more commonly think of as being alive, like death caps and wasps and chrysanthemums and this protista. And we are going to focus on that domain. But first, what are the things that make an animal or an organism fit in the domain eukarya? What makes them different from bacteria or archaea? That would be a membrane-bound nucleus. So you can see this picture of a prokaryotic cell, which the archaea and bacteria are. It only has a nucleoid area. It doesn't have a membrane around the nucleus. And these eukaryotic cells have a membrane around the nucleus. So everything we're going to talk about from here on out is in the domain eukarya, and they will all have a membrane-bound nucleus. 
So do keep precious creatures organized. That K, do you remember what that K stood for? Stood for kingdom. So there are four kingdoms in the domain Eukarya. There's the kingdom Protista, kingdom Fungi, kingdom Plantae, and kingdom Animalia. And veterinarians need to know about all of these. So an example of a protist is Plasmodium. Does anyone know maybe what disease Plasmodium causes? causes malaria. So plasmodium is carried by the Anopheles mosquito. If the Anopheles mosquito has this protist inside it and bites a human, now the human is infected with malaria. Well, if the next, the next mosquito comes and bites that person, now the person and that second mosquito have malaria, and then that second mosquito can go infect other people. So veterinarians work to make sure that this cycle can get interrupted, there are chemicals we use to kill mosquitoes, and we make sure that those don't kill other animals. And then there are 200 kinds of malaria. Five of them infect people. The other 195 infect animals. So veterinarians need to know what that looks like. Another fun thing to think about is antibiotics. Maybe some of y'all have taken antibiotics at some point, or you know what antibiotics do. So do you know what antibiotics kill? They kill bacteria. And is plasmodium a bacteria? No, plasmodium is a protist. So you cannot treat a protist infection like malaria with an antibiotic. It's not a bacterial infection. So you have to treat it with anti-protist drugs or anti-malaria drugs. So it's important that veterinarians and other medical professionals know the difference between a protist and a bacteria because they're treated differently. When you go to the doctor, they need to know that. The next category is fungus. And veterinarians need to know about fungus for quite a few reasons. This is a fungus called dermatophytus. That's what it looks like under a microscope. Well, if an animal gets infected with a dermatophytus, it causes ringworm. You can see this spot above the cat's eye where the hair has fallen out. It's got kind of a slimy covering on it. That's not a worm infection, it's a fungal infection. And ringworm is a zoonotic disease. Zoonotic means that it's transferred from animals to people. Ringworm can be passed from person to person as well. It's not that bad of a disease, you just need to put some cream on it and it goes away, but it can be a big deal if it's left untreated. So veterinarians have to know when a cat comes in or a dog or a cow comes in with ringworm, the vet has to know it's ringworm, they have to know it's not a worm, it's a fungus, and they have to know to tell the owner, you should probably go home and look at yourself and see if you're infected as well. So fungus are also very important that vets know about. Now, can anyone think of a reason why a veterinarian would need to know about plants? Animals eat plants, and plants aren't always good for the animal. So lupine is a plant that grows in Texas, and if a cow eats lupine while it's pregnant, its calf is born with crooked legs, like you can see on this upper calf. So if a vet goes to a farm and sees a calf like that, the vet needs to know that the cow should stop eating lupine and the rancher needs to cut it all down, but also the veterinarian might be able to do a surgery or put casts on the calf's legs and try to make those legs straighten out. And then of course veterinarians need to know about animals and what makes an animal an animal. So what makes an animal different from plants and fungus and protists? Well, animals are always multicellular, which plants are as well, but animals are. So even little things like nematodes, which are very, very tiny words, and then of course chickens are multicellular. They have organs, they have body systems, all of these cells come together to make one thing. And then the difference between animals and plants is that animals are heterotrophs. Have you all heard the word heterotroph before? Heterotroph means they eat things, they can't make their own energy. So of course you have this monarch caterpillar eating a leaf. But you also have sponges. Sea sponges are animals that live in the bottom of the ocean. And in this picture, somebody has taken some food coloring and put it in the water. And you can see the sponge pulling the water through itself, filtering out the food it's gonna eat, and then the rest of the water floats away. So even animals that are, don't really look like what we think animals are, like sea sponges, are heterotrophs. So we're gonna talk about animals for the rest of the time. So everything we talk about is multicellular and a heterotroph. Do keep precious creatures. That P stood for phylums. So there are a lot of phylums in the kingdom Animalia, and veterinarians work with some that you might not think of. 
like platy helminths. This is a picture of a platy helminth called Fasciola hepatica. It's a liver fluke. In particular, these ones are liver flukes that infect sheep. And they get inside the sheep, they live in the liver, it's an animal, and it makes the sheep really sick. So vets need to know how to treat the sheep and what makes them better when they're treated. Nematodes, this is a nematode called a whipworm. Whipworms infect all kinds of mammals. They cause intestinal infections and they can make the animal really sick and weak. So part of that pill that you give to your dog or what you put on their neck, make sure that they don't get whipworms. Veterinarians have to work with arthropods. We talked before about diseases that ticks carry and they can carry lots of different kinds of diseases. There are different kinds of ticks. They live in different areas. These are all things that veterinarians have to know. And then of course Chordata. This is a northern right rhinoceros and he's probably a bit sedated, but those are some veterinarians working on him. So we're going to focus on the phylum Chordata. So we're going to talk about what makes an animal fit in the phylum Chordata. At some point when that animal was developing, before it was born, it had a notochord, which eventually developed into the spinal cord. So I've got some pictures of animals before they were born. They're not fully formed, they're just still in the egg. So this picture of a zebrafish, you can see the notochord in there. This wood frog is not a tadpole yet, it's still inside the egg, and you can see the notochord in there. And then the mouse, this is a very, very young mouse, and you can see the notochord in there. So all the animals we talk about from here on out are in the phylum Chordata, and they all have a notochord. Do keep precious creatures, so that C stood for class. So there are different classes in the phylum Chordata, and I'm going to focus on the ones that veterinarians work on since I want to be a vet. So there's the class Actinopterygii, which is the ray-finned fishes. This is a picture of a tilapia farm. So maybe you like to eat tilapia, I like eating tilapia, and it's actually grown on farms. So if all of the tilapia get sick, they have to call a veterinarian. Then of course amphibia, this is a white dumpy tree frog, and some people have these as pets so they have to go to the vet if they get sick. Reptiles and aves. Maybe some of y'all had birds or lizards as pets. This is a leopard gecko. My sister used to have one, and they have to go to the vet. And then, of course, mammals. This is a three-toed sloth. There are veterinarians that work on sloths. We're going to focus on mammalia for the rest of the time. So what puts an animal inside the class mammalia? What makes it different from this lizard and fish and frog? There are three things. The first is kind of a weird one that I didn't know about before I wrote this presentation, but all mammals have middle ear bones. These help them balance and help them hear really well. And this is a picture of a dime and then human ear bones. So they're very, very small. All mammals have hair. Now, are there mammals in the ocean? There are, there are whales and dolphins. So we have a picture of a southern right whale. Now, if this whale is a mammal, it has to have hair. So if we really look closely at this whale's nose, we can see hair here. Hopefully you can see some hair. They're coming off the nose, they're on the top part and the bottom part, so even mammals in the ocean have hair. The last thing that makes an animal a mammal is they have mammary glands. All mammals make milk for their young. Now you might have heard of a platypus. That's an animal, it's a mammal, but it lays eggs. So does it still make milk for its babies? It does. Even though those babies hatch from an egg, here we have a picture of a mother nursing her baby platypi. So they do still make milk. So do keep precious creatures organized. That O stood for order. So there are different orders in the class of mammalia. And there are actually a lot of orders from the class of mammalia. So I just put some pictures up of animals that veterinarians might work with in Texas from different classes. So here we have a possum, an armadillo, a rabbit, a rat. Veterinarians work with rats for pets and also if you work for research. A lot of research is done on rats. Primates would primarily be research. Chiroptera is bats. Now can anyone think of a reason why it's important that veterinarians, particularly in Texas, know about bats? That's right, bats carry rabies. So it's important that vets know how rabies works, where the bats live, and where their life cycles are, how they look when they're healthy, how they look when they're sick. All of these things are things that vets need to know about. Then we have Insectivora is he 
hedgehogs, carnivorous dogs and cats. We've got goats, dolphins, maybe if you work for SeaWorld or the zoo in Dallas or Houston. Then we have horses and elephants. Again, if you worked for the zoo. But we're going to focus on the order of carnivora. So think of all those animals are mammals. That hedgehog, the goat, the dolphin, they're all mammals. But what makes that cat and dog different? What puts them in the order of carnivora? Well, there are a couple of things. They all have well-developed canines. So like their name says, they eat meat. So they have good canine teeth to tear this meat apart. Like you can see on this picture of the leopard seal and the skunk. They also have a long nose and complex turbines. These little bones, if you took the skunk and cut his nose off and cleaned it up, you would see these little bones in there. And they make the air tumble, and that helps them <coughs> smell, because these animals have to smell to hunt. So you can see on this lion skull and bear skull that those bones are very complicated. They're swirly and all kinds of stuff is going on. The last thing that makes these mammal, all these mammals similar is they all have carnassals, which is this particular shape of their last two teeth. And you can see that on that ferret skull and in the hyena mouth. So these are the things that all of the animals we talk about from here on out will be in the order carnivora, and they will all have these three characteristics. So do keep precious creatures organized for so that four stood for families, and there are different families in the order Carnivora. There's the family Canidae is wolves. Family Odobenidae is a walrus. Family Phocidae is the harbor seal. Family Procyonidae is the raccoon. Family Mustelidae is ferrets. Family Ursidae is the bear. Family Iurlidae is the red panda. Family Felidae has the mountain lion in it. Family Hyenidae is hyenas. Family Eupleridae is a fusa. Family Herpestae is the meerkats. So all of these animals are very different. There are lots of families, but again, they all have the teeth, the nose, the turbines, and the carnassals. And we're going to focus on the family Felidae for the rest of the time because I'm a cat person, so we're going to do that. Now, what makes that cat different from all these other animals? What makes it different from the bear, or the seal, or the walrus? Well, there are three main things. So they all have retractable claws. You can see this lion when he's just hanging out. That's a really big paw, but there are no claws. But when he retracts those tendons, you can see the claws come out. And this is a picture we spent a lot of time learning about in vet school. Cats are strict carnivores, so all of the animals on that previous slide were carnivores. They all eat meat. But bears also eat fruits and nuts and berries, and dogs do too. Cats are some of the strictest carnivores. They pretty much only eat meat. So you can see this jaguar fighting with a caiman. They also have different balance and flexibility from all the other animals. They jump a lot differently, they twist differently, they usually land on their feet. You can see this is a caracal, which is a wild cat, jumping for some sort of toy that's on a fishing line type thing. So they have a very, diff a very complicated sense of balance and flexibility. So do keep precious creatures organized for grumpy. That G stood for genus. So there are different genera in the family Felidae. Genera Acinox is the cheetah. Genera genus Caracal is the caracal. Genus Leptilaris is the serval. Genus Felis, that's a manual. Genus Puma is the mountain lion. Genus Lynx is the bobcat. We do have those in Texas. Genus Neophilus is the clouded leopard. Genus Panthera is the Bengal tiger. And genus Uncia is the snow leopard. These are actually split into two groups by which cats roar and which cats don't. So do you think the group with the mountain lion roar or the group with the tiger? It's the group with the tiger. So I actually have a recording that a scientist has made of a tiger roaring that we can listen to now. So that's quite an impressive roar. I would be very scared if I heard that in the jungle. These different cats actually make different happy noises as well. And the happy noise that Bengal tigers make it's called chuffing. It's what scientists call it. C-H-U-F-F-I-N-G. Chuffing. So I have a recording of a tiger making a chuffing noise. So I just think that's kind of cool. And you can go home and tell your parents that you know what a happy tiger sounds like. But we're going to focus on the animals in the genus Felis for the rest of this time. So what makes those animals different from the other cats? What puts it in that category? Actually, it's just that they're smaller. 
the scientists couldn't think of a way to group everything, so they just put all the small cats in the same category. So you can see you should never, ever, ever have a wild animal in your house. It is a bad idea, but for some reason, this person has a wild serval in their house. Well, it's probably lived in their house for a while, but it's still a wild animal. And you can see how tall that serval is getting up on the kitchen counter compared to this domestic long hair. And then, of course, this kitten is little and adorable. So do keep precious creatures organized for grumpy scientists. That S stood for species. So there are different species in the genus Felis. There's the Felis vieti, is the Chinese desert cat. The Felis catus, that's a picture of my cat, that's your domestic cat. Felis chaus is a jungle cat. Felis manual is the manual. Felis margarita is the Persian sand cat. Felis nigripes is the black-footed cat. Felis sylvestris is the wild cat. Now, the cats that you might see running around in a parking lot or in your apartment complex, those are domestic cats. They've just lived away from people for a while, so they're called feral. That's different from these other cats. These other cats are wild animals. They've never lived with people. They're not domesticated. They're physically different from domestic cats. They don't act the same. Even if you have one of these other cats in your house from the time it's kitten, it's still a wild animal. It's still going to act like a wild animal. We said all these cats were smaller than the bigger cats, and that's true. They're all probably in your 20 pound or less range. And they're adorable, they're cute, but they're not pets. They act very different, and they are different. But we're gonna focus on the Felis catus for the rest of the time, and we're gonna talk about what makes it different from these other cats. There are three main things. They are calmer, like I was saying, they're not wild animals. They've lived around humans for thousands of years. They have better color variation. This black-footed cat needs to hunt. It needs to run around so the bigger things don't see it because that would kill them. And the little things can see it so that it can hunt them. So it needs to be sort of hidden. This Turkish Angora is hanging out in the living room. It doesn't matter what sees it. That was a cat meowing. I'm sure you all have heard that before. And domestic cats are actually the only cats that meow, and they only meow at humans. So it's a thing that they've picked up over domestication process that they've learned as a way to communicate with humans. Those other cats we saw won't, won't make that noise. So there are different breeds inside a species of Felis catus. These are all Felis catus. They're all domestic cats. They can all breed together, and their babies could breed together. But they look different, and humans have done this. We've bred the animals that looked one way together until they looked different from other things. <coughs> so Abyssinians are a breed of cat. They're all this red color. They have angular faces and really big ears. Sphinxes. Now this is a mammal, so does it have hair? It does. It just has very little hair. Cornish Rex are sort of an in-between. They have some hair. It's kind of wavy. Maine Coons are your biggest breed of domestic Felis Canis. They're about 20 pounds. Persians, this is a very overbred Persian. I personally don't think this is a good idea. It's not very healthy for the cat. But you can see his nose is almost under his eyes. And then the Highland Fold, you can see his ears are folded over. So now we're going to do a little bit of review with my cat. I think she's adorable. This is Finch. She's a seven-year-old Abyssinian cross. So there are things that put her in categories with all the animals we talked about. So if you can think of some things that make her like the Abyssinian. She has big ears very angular face and a slim body. There are things that make her like the Felis Canis. That is the bright colors. She meows and she's fairly calm. There are things that she has in common with Manuel. She's in this genus Felis with the Manuel and that's the smaller size. She's different from the other family Felidae. But she is in the family Felidae so she has things in common with this mountain lion. That's the retractable claws we talked about, the balance of flexibility, and the strict carnivore diet. There are things that put her in common with the order carnivora that she has in common with this puppy. That's the middle ear bones, the long nose, the complex turbines, and the carnassal teeth in the back of her mouth. She's in the class mammalia, so she has things in common with this three-toed sloth. That's the mammary glands. She's spayed. You should always spay your cats, but if she were to have kittens, she would make milk. She has the inner ear bones, and she has hair. She also fits in the phylum chordata. She has things in common with this rhinoceros. When they were embryos, they both had a notochord. She's in the kingdom Animalia, so we talked about them being multicellular heterotrophs. She has common, things in common with this deep sea fish. Even 
and then they look nothing in life. They're both in the kingdom Animalia. And then she's in the domain eukarya. We talked about the nuclear membrane. This protist and her, every one of their cells has a nuclear membrane. What is your favorite thing about being in vet school? My favorite thing about being in vet school? I became a veterinarian, or working to become a veterinarian, because I love animals, and my day is just happier when I'm around animals all day. So we do get to be around animals a bit, but I also am getting to learn about medicine. And medicine is really cool, and it's complicated, and it's a puzzle, and a patient comes in, and you have to figure out what's wrong with the patient, and you have to listen to the client, and try and figure out the whole story and what's happening inside the body and what's happening outside the body and what medicine you can give. So I just love learning about those things. So that's my favorite thing about being in vet school. Why is taxonomy important in, in, in the veterinary medicine? So scientists use taxonomy so that they know exactly what they're talking about. When somebody says Felis canis, they are talking about a domestic cat. And it's a good way for scientists in different areas or they might speak different languages, but they know exactly what they're talking about. And it's also a way to organize, like bacteria, you organize a group of bacteria maybe by what antibiotic works against them. So if you read the name of a bacteria and you see a certain genus name, you know that bacteria in that genus can be killed with a certain antibiotic. So it's just a good way to keep everything organized. There are so many plants and so many animals and so many bacteria that science need, scientists need to make sure that they know what they're talking about. What did you have to do to get into vet school? What did I have to do to get into vet school? So I spent a lot of time working at veterinary clinics. And I was 16 when I started. And I would definitely recommend if any of you are interested in veterinary medicine or any other career, go find someone who does that and follow them around for a day and you'll really find out whether or not you like it. So I worked with veterinarians for a long time. I made sure I had good grades in high school, particularly math and science grades. And then when I went to college, I also had to work with veterinarians mostly in the summers and make sure I did well in all my classes and then I managed my time and studied and maybe had a little bit of fun, but made sure my grades were good. How important is uh, math in veterinary medicine? How important is math in veterinary medicine? So we use sort of the more simple math. We use things like multiplication and division to figure out how much medicine you give an animal. So if you think of a chihuahua, you think of an elephant, they might get the same medicine, but they certainly get different amounts of the medicine. So veterinarians need to be able to do that math. A lot of math also <coughs> taught you how to think and how to study. So I don't use calculus every day as a veterinarian. But I took calculus, and it taught me how to study. It was difficult, and so I had to learn study habits. I had to learn to keep track of my homework. I had to learn to go talk to my professors when I needed help. So even if it teaches you something that you might not use every day, it still teaches you skills that you will use every day. <clears throat> even though you're a veterinary student now and become a veterinarian in the future, why is it veterinarians have continuing education? So we're in, or I'm in veterinary school right now, but veterinarians take continuing education classes every year for the rest of your life, as long as you're a veterinarian. So the question is, why do we do that? So medicine is always changing. We're always learning new things about bodies. We're learning new things about bacteria. And then things Hello. that we knew may Welcome not to be the true anymore, system. so they might be changing. To join a conference, you may use the far end camera control. So things that you are learning about might be changing. Some about an antibiotic that worked 10 years ago might not work anymore. Or a disease might have moved. Somebody with that disease got on a plane and came over here and now that disease is here and it wasn't. So veterinarians and other medical professionals, doctors and nurses, have to make sure that we know what's happening right now and we know the newest things and the best things. So we go to classes every year to make sure we know what's happening. Why are animals quarantined sometimes? Why are animals quarantined sometimes? So I just mentioned that people can get sick in other countries and get on planes and then come into the country and get their parents sick or their friends sick, and that might not be a disease we had here before. Animals can do the same thing. So if you are bringing an animal into the United States and it's coming from a country that has a disease that we don't have here, we might keep that animal and make sure they don't have that disease. 
So we might keep them for 10 days, we might keep them for three months. It depends on what the disease is and how long it takes to tell whether or not they have that disease. So they're kept in a place where they can't infect other animals and where a veterinarian watches them and makes sure that they're safe to come in. Because even though it's your pet and you love them, sometimes it's not safe for them to be next to you. So the vet makes sure that that's good. You, you mentioned zoonotic diseases. What are those and how can we prevent them? Zoonotic diseases were the diseases that came from animals to people. So things like ringworm, which is the fungal infection we talked about, but also things like rabies. Rabies is a really big problem. I mentioned a little bit in Texas. We have some of the highest cases of rabies in the United States. And that's a disease that's transferred through saliva. So that one, you want to make sure you're not bit by an animal with rabies. The five most common animals with rabies in Texas are skunks, raccoons, foxes, coyotes, and bats. So if you ever see one of these animals out and it's acting weird or even just it's out, you want to make sure that they don't bite you. So it depends on the disease, how you prevent yourself from getting them, but particular rabies, you do that. And then for ringworm, make sure you don't touch any animal that has hair missing or has slimy stuff on its skin, try not to touch it. If you have to touch it, you know, wrap it in a blanket, wash your hands really good, maybe just to take it to the veterinarian and then see if you need some cream to put on your hands anyways. What is the coolest animal you've ever seen? What is the coolest animal I've ever seen? Well, as a veterinarian or a vet assistant at the time, I worked at a clinic in Houston that treated horses mostly and we saw a zebra once because zebras are fairly close to horses so we saw a sick zebra that was pretty cool could he kick he was too sick to kick unfortunately but zebras could kick i imagine they run like horses and and like i was saying they were wild animals so even though the zebra had been around people it was still a wild animal and it was still going to act like a wild animal so we were very careful around the zebra even though he was quite sick uh, how does the kids use taxonomy in their daily lives? So it's important that kids know taxonomy or that you know taxonomy so that you can know what you're talking about. If you have a domestic cat, that's great, but if you find someone and they're saying, hey, I have a Felis BFT at my house, you should probably know you shouldn't go to their house because it's a wild animal and that's a little dangerous. So as a as a student or as a kid, you should know these terms a little bit and sort of be knowledgeable about how things are organized. And certainly if you get into science, it's later in life, it's good to have a basic knowledge of these things. Because if you forget them, you have to relearn them and you should just learn them in the first place. I think that's the end of our questions here. I hope you all enjoyed the presentation. You can go to the PEER website, peer.tamu.edu. If you have any other burning questions, you are welcome to send an email to some of the contact information on there and I can try to get to those. So have a good day and I hope you all have a great summer coming up.